Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Maggie Howell, and I'm the executive director here at the Wolf Conservation Center. Um, before we get started, I just wanna go over a few uh, housekeeping tips. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the Q&A box in the control panel. And there will be time after Amy's presentation uh, where we can have some questions. Also, a recorded version of this webinar will be available um, within a day or two on the Wolf Conservation Center website. So today we have Amy Schutt of the uh, Canid Project, and she joins us to introduce the history of red wolves in Louisiana and Texas and reveal what she discovered by tracking down archival reports of the last red wolves there. And with Wolf Conservation Center senior research scientist, Joey Hinton, uh, discuss the current research around the discovery of red wolf remnants persisting in the wild canids there today. Amy Shutt is the founder of the Canid Project, a 501c3 nonprofit focusing on wild canid education, outreach, and rescue. She's a professional documentary uh, photographer and multimedia producer interested in the sensory rich storytelling of wildlife science, natural history, and conservation. Her projects combine historical research, sound design, photography, and videography to create dynamic multimedia that educates and inspires action. Amy's work has been published in books and magazines and also displayed in the Smithsonian's National, National Museum of uh, Natural History in Washington, DC. So we're really excited to get started. So at this point, I think I'm gonna turn it over to you, Amy. Thanks for being here. Hey, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, happy to be here today. Um, so Maggie did a good job of introducing me. So my very first slide, which was sort of introducing me, um, I'm just gonna quickly go over a little bit about the Canaan Project just because it has to do with how I got involved with this project. Um, one of the, the things that I really wanted to start with the Canaan Project is to be able to, to share the, the science, especially of uh, the wild canids, especially in the United States. Um, while you know there's always these studies going on, we just don't often get to hear about it or really get to, or maybe not even really understand it in a way that, you know, that's easy, right? Um, so I thought, you know, why not try to connect with some scientists who are doing some really important studies and in, uh, in use my photography, because I've been a photographer for 20 years, and uh, try to try to get that going. And that's sort of what started the whole, this is, you know, my, my nonprofit, so the Canaan Project, that was the, the core mission of it. So this is really my first um, full-time kind of dive into this uh, due to COVID, I guess, unfortunately, but fortunately for me and, and hopefully for the scientist in the wolves, um, I have been able to put a lot of time into this. So that's sort of where I start um, with, with this whole story of the red wolf. I've always been interested in the wolves in, um, in Louisiana because, you know, they were here not too long ago. Um, you know, I was born in 75, so they were probably still here at that point. Uh, so I am a native of Louisiana and um, this has always been an interest of me, but it became a bit more of an interest um, over the last few years. So I just kind of want to show you guys, I'm sure, Joey went over this a little bit, but just so you guys have an idea a little bit of, of that historic range of the Red Wolf. And as we all know now, here, here is where uh, the reintroduced population lives in North Carolina. But down here in the Southeast, so all of Louisiana, they were all over Louisiana, as far as we know, all over it. And Texas, Texas is so huge, but Texas, they were pretty much in this Eastern part of Texas. And the eastern part of Texas is a really unique uh, ecoregion. It's, it's got these piney woods and, and then it's got this amazing like coastal prairie down into here. Um, and so this, you know, this area right here was sort of, you know, where, where they, this was sort of their limit, right? There were wolves, of course, at the time, oops, sorry, um, across the entire state of Texas, but the red wolf um, was really more isolated in this little pocket here of, of Texas. Um, so what happened was when, you know, East, when the East, the Europeans came to the East Coast, they really did very quickly decimate all of the, the wolves there. I mean, I don't even think, I think Joey had mentioned to me, Dr. Hinton had mentioned that there's not even records in North, I mean, in uh, New Jersey, like bounty records, because they, they didn't even, it was before they even needed to do bounties, they basically annihilated them there. So this, you know, this section was, was just 
they were gone pretty quickly. And even into Florida, there are a few record, records of Florida of this black wolf or red wolf, um, but not many. And I think, to be honest, we only have a couple specimens of it uh, in collections, as well as the same thing goes for Mississippi and Alabama. Um, so really, the you know, the this area here, Louisiana and Texas, uh, and even a, a little bit into Arkansas is probably where um, we see the most when I say specimens, I mean, you know, in, in actual like scientific collections like the Smithsonian and there, this is like behind the scene collections uh, where they, you know, they collect uh, the skulls and the skeletons or tissue or the skins of, of all the animals. So um, there's just not a lot. So it, there, that's sort of been one of the problems I think with, with the red wolf is that we just don't really know much about that animal. Um, because what happened was by the time they were down to literally this, this area, that was all that was left of them. This was in this, like the seventies. Okay. So they were pretty much completely gone. I mean, there may have been, you know, tiny little remnants of them here and there, but by the seventies, this is where they were restricted to right there, which is, um, it's pretty sad. And it, it, it and the, one of the reasons I think it's so especially sad is because, you know, the, we're looking at a map, you know, that, is talking about where they took that source population that's the founders of all of the wolves that are in North Carolina right now so when we talk that's what the source population is and there were only 12 of them so when you think about that in 1979 they had 12 animals that they deemed as being pretty much the only red wolves left that's you know that's pretty sad considering we didn't really realize that they were in danger until the 60s and I think that's something that not a lot of people realize. Um, at the time, you know, th these people were, you know, people, Europeans were moving in across Texas, especially they were uh, setting up homesteads. They were setting up, you know, getting rid of prairie and, and setting up, uh, you know, these um, animal agriculture, you know, cows and, and sheep that was, sheep was a big thing at, at the time uh they were you know the bison had they killed the bison off pretty quickly uh so they could they could do that and they got rid of every every predator you that there is and so that's just you know part of what started this and if you look I just want to show you a little bit of an up close image here so if you look like we're right this is the gulf of mexico okay so all of this is, you know, like back over here in, in the east, I mean, the west part of Texas, that's, you know, the plains and stuff like that. You've got woods here, you've got swamps, and then you've got this coastal prairie that, you know, you can't really, you could do some, some cattle stuff there, but mostly this was, this ended up becoming like a really big hotspot for oil, like the oil industry. And uh, that really took hold in, in the early 1900s. And also all of this timber that was around this, these areas were, was really valuable for logging. And so they started cutting, clear cutting all along the East Texas area, uh, leaving this just this little pocket here where these probably these animals were, were kind of, that was kind of their only like safe spot. They were, they were losing their habitat. Uh, and then they were being pushed out of, of these areas in a way because they didn't have anywhere else to go. The, the deer were, were being decimated as well because we didn't have any hunting regulations at the you know, turn of the century, um, you know, early 1900s. And so we had you know, very low deer number. And so they were coming in and they were, they were probably attacking these, um, the pig and the sheep, and that was causing this huge conflict with humans at the time. So this is just an, I like this image because it kind of just shows you, especially in Texas, People sometimes I don't think people realize so much like Texas has a really beautiful a whole like big thicket area on the east. That's a really, really beautiful area of, of uh, deep forest and swamp and bottomland hardwoods. And that, you know, extends obviously into uh, Louisiana. And so these animals, the ones that we, we, we talk about and the ones that I'm going to show you a lot of pictures of are from like north um, Louisiana and that northern part of Texas, that northern northeast part of Texas, I should say. Um, and those wolves were often very dark in color, um, which was the thing that really just blew me. I had no idea. It was like the this black wolf, right? Um, and so it makes sense. They were living in these really, you think about the swamps back then, they were these really you know, dark, uh, 
sometimes impassable areas that people were not even able to get into. There were no roads up there, especially in, in the Tensaw area of, of uh, Northeast Louisiana. Um, and it was, you know, imagine it was full of mosquitoes and alligators. And there were, at that time, there would have been, you know, mountain lions out there. Um, the wolves were there. I mean, these were kind of like areas, that, they weren't settled early for a reason. And it was because they were completely inaccessible to humans um, until they were able to start, you know, getting in there and, and they started logging pretty quickly in uh, the early 1900s. So that's sort of the habitat that we're looking at right there. Um, and so the, you know, we see the very first instances of, of the, these descriptions of these animals coming up. I mean, Audubon was the one who actually scientifically described this animal first. Um, and he had the, these two drawings. Now, the one on the the left, that's what he considered the red Texan wolf. And I think that's even what it's titled. Uh, the one on the right is what he called the black wolf. And that was like the one in Florida. Okay. So this was in 1851. There had been a little, you know, a few descriptions before that. Um, there was a guy named Bartram that had uh, gone down to Texas, uh, not Texas, I'm sorry, Florida in 1791 and talked about these little black, these little black wolves. And uh, he said they were small. And at the same time, there were a lot of what they called Indian dogs that uh, were similar in size and, and shape. They were mostly black as well. Um, and so there's sometimes I think there's confusion in some of the historical documents because, you know, actually Bartram even talked about there being a, like spotted or, you know, spotted wolves, but it was the, it was the, it was probably the Indian dogs. But um, so that those, those are the, Sadly, these are some of the only two drawings we have of these animals that that we can even, you know, even think about. They're not even photographs, but just to think about what they would have looked like. Um, and you know, if you look at the one on the left, obviously that looks a lot like our guys up in um, you know up in North Carolina. Um, I would love to see a Florida black wolf, but uh, you know, like I said, I think there's really one or just one or two specimens, and it's it's not much. It's just like a skull and a skin, and that's it. So after that. Um, Let's see, hold on one second. I want to show you this real quick before we move on. This is the only thing I could find as far as something else other than that picture of a black wolf. This is from a, a magazine. It's called Birds and Nature. It's from 1904. And this is a really fantastic uh, little write up about that animal. And any of these things, obviously, like I know Maggie's recording this, you guys should go back and, and pause this later and read some of these little articles I'm going to show you because they're just, it's interesting to see what they were thinking and saying about these animals at the time. That animal looks like a very small dog or a, wolf, a fox to me. I don't know if that is actually a black wolf from Florida. I don't know. But it was with this article, and it, that's, what, that's what it is uh, referred to in, in, the, uh, in the credits. But, you know, it kind of does look a little bit like, like, uh, like this guy back here, really, if you think about it. And you know, I, we don't have any, I can't tell how big that animal is. It, it could be rather large, but that was pretty much the only, the only other thing I could find um, as far as that black wolf in Florida goes. So what happened was um, there was a guy that came along, his name was Goldman. And then he, he, in 19, the 1930s, and he said, you know what? He said, he looked at the map of these animals and he said, I'm gonna go back to my map. He said, you know what? I think this animal that's, you know, in Louisiana and Texas and the one that's going back to my map, all across like Florida and Alabama, he said, that's probably all the same animal. It's the same animal, but there's just different subspecies because they live in different habitats. And so he ended up uh, designating them as a, their, you know, he said, they're definitely their own species. They're not a gray wolf. And he proposed that we put them into these three subspecies. And so that's how they've been known from here on. And the subspecies thing is, um, I'm, it's kind of technical. I'm not gonna get really into it. It is important as far as the Endangered Species Act goes. So it is important that we know what, what that is, but um, I'll touch on that a little bit later. But, um, but I wanna show you first some of the differences just physically if you're looking at, like, cause that's interesting to me. If you think about the regions of Louisiana. So North Louisiana is very different than South Louisiana. You've got these hills, like it doesn't even, like when I go up to North Louisiana, it feels like I'm not even in Louisiana. I think, of, and I'm not really there that often. I live in Southeast Louisiana, but it's very hilly. And, uh, you know, there's these pine forests and it's just, you know, they have swamp, but they also have these hills. And where I live, it is flat. Like I'm, I'm like 
I think where I live is literally four feet above sea level. So like it's like I'm almost on the coast. But this animal here, um, this is a pretty easy to find picture. It's, it's at the LSU library. Uh, this was an animal that was taken as a puppy from Natchitoches, Louisiana, and was raised. His name was Mike. And this was in um, the 1920s. And then taken to uh, Virginia. And he lived in Virginia. And this, this place I actually found, I found, I was able to find the background on this picture to some degree. Um, but that picture is, is a, it's a, it's a old house that's in, in, um, in Virginia. And this is actually a little boy. It's not a little girl, but I mean, so it, yeah, it does make the animal look large because he's standing next to like a, what, nine, 10 year old little boy. But if you look at that animal, that does not look anything like what I would have thought, you know, you know, it, it, it's got these really long legs. It's kind of, um, it's got this sort of greyhound face, you know, very long face. It's very different looking than the wolves that I'm used to seeing in Yellowstone or, you know, the ones that we're used to seeing like gray wolves, right? Um, but this is such a, I think, an important picture because it's from the 20s and likely um, this would be an animal that would have been far enough away from the coyotes, which would have been the closest coyotes would have been in Texas at the time. Um, so this probably represents maybe you know, a, a, re, a true red wolf that had no hybridization, no introgression from, from coyotes. Um, and I'm sure most of you guys, and Joey talked about that last uh, week, Dr. Hinton talked about that, but that was one of the, one of the things that caused uh, this animal's demise. But at this time, as far as we know, the coyotes were still in Texas. They had not moved this far over um, into the East yet. So I think that that is a, it's one of my favorite pictures and to think that, you know, I, I would love to find out what happened to this animal and where it went and the entire story behind it. And I have tried, but um, maybe one day I will. But so this is, yeah, that's one of the, the great shots we have. This is another one that's from Louisiana. This is also up north. And this was, it's, it says it's 1940, but I have a feeling it's a bit earlier than that. Um, and this was up in uh, an area called... Uh, Oh my gosh, it's just like escaping my mind. And I know it's maybe Claiborne Parish. But anyway, these kids had set up a uh, fox trap. They were trying to trap foxes and they ended up getting this wolf. And once again, you've got two dogs there and you can see that animal. I mean, it's a very slender, tall animal. Look at the legs on that animal. And I mean, he's, you know, if you look at the foot compared to that other, um, that child, you know, on the, on the right, like it, that's a big animal, but also slender not you know I feel like gray wolves tend to have this kind of more like bulky stocky look um and I think that's one of the reasons I wanted to find all these old photographs and this old history is because I you know we have the North Carolina ones but animals do look different based on where they live and, and what they're you know like their little eco regions right of where they're where they're located and so you know I, I just I wanted I wanted to see the, the ones that might have been up north did they look any different and because we don't have any of the black ones anymore the black the black that black melanistic mutation that causes that black pelage uh was not in the founders that we ended up using to um to to propagate for the release of the animals in uh, North Carolina so we don't have we, we've lost that black uh variation so I'm always on the look for the black wolf. Uh, okay, so here we go, the black wolf. So this is also North Louisiana. So there was a guy, and uh, I'm not going to go into it too much because I know Joey's talked about this before, and and I, there, it's becoming more popular. I think people know this story more. But there was a guy named Tapping Gregory. He was a lawyer. He was in Chicago, and he had this pretty massive hobby of photography. And it's pretty as a photographer, I was pretty impressed. I'm like, this guy had basically like one of the very first, um, we call them trap cameras. So he, but the, he's using large format cameras that had glass negatives, like these huge cameras. And he had, you know, basically designed this setup where he would put a pan down and he connected it to his big, big, comp, you know, um, camera and a flash. Okay. And he would cover it over with, you know, dirt and leaves, and then he would leave it out and, and when an animal would come by, if, if it happened to come by and step on it, it would get a picture, which is pretty impressive for 1935. Um, it's hard now to do tramp, like cap, tra um, I'm sorry, trap uh, camera photography, even with like digital cameras and all the technology we have. I cannot imagine how expensive and frustrating this probably was for him, but he's, he's got a, a huge, uh, 
amazing library. He, he published several books. If you want to look him up, his name's Tapping Gregory uh, out of Chicago. Uh, anyway, I, I love reading his books and I love looking at all his amazing camera trap pictures, but that's what he did. He, he wanted to get a picture of this animal. And so one of the places that he knew that they were still being seen was in North, uh, North Louisiana. And this was in like 1930s. And there's an area up there called the Tensaw. And uh, it's very swampy, one of those dark swampy places I was telling about that is really hard to access. There weren't roads into there. I mean, you had to be like a pretty legit outdoorsman to get out there and, and probably to survive out there. And at this, at the same time, this was also the place that held the very last ivory bill woodpeckers. And this was actually the same decade within, I think, a year of each other that they did studies out there on the ivory bill woodpecker and that Tappan came out and got these pictures of the wolves. So this place to me is like, you know, it's like one of the very last, you know, kind of, I, I, I like to think of it as like primeval, but some of it was second growth, but it was, it was one of the very last old growth forest, you know, um, in this area. And so he did go down and he went down um, with some guys from uh, some federal trappers and they, they were out there for almost a month. And he, these are a couple of his pictures. And I want you to notice this picture is my favorite. The one on the right, um, look at the back legs of that animal. It's tall. It's taller than I would expect it to be, but it's tall. It's a big, tall animal, but it also has that slender look. This here, this picture is from a place called um, Sharkies. It was a hunting club. And this is inside, inside the Tinsaw base. And so, so he would have stayed at this Sharky, at the Sharky's cabin back uh, when he was here. And so this was from 1936. This is one of the um, black wolves that they would have killed. So then, then you can kind of, you know, look at this man and you can kind of see the size difference. It's a big animal, but it's, it's once again, slender. Um, I also have a, um, we have a skull at LSU here in Louisiana um, of a black wolf and it's got it written on a skull, you know, black, black wolf uh, Tallulah, which is where Tensaw is. Um, 1935. So, I mean, for all we know, it could have been this animal. Uh, so that's, that's some of the only pictures we have of black wolves that I knew of until I really started digging. So here's a few others from North Louisiana. And um, this, the one on the left uh, would be 1948. And the guy that's holding the, the wolf's ears that's a guy that his name is Joe Herring, and he was um, very the very first supervisor of our predator control program, which started here in Louisiana in 1947. Okay, so that's I mean this picture I found from uh, after after he died, uh, there was another supervisor who has been who had been with the program from the very beginning, and his name was um, T. E. Doc Harris, and I met his son. I found his son, and. His son is now about 80 years old. His name's Glenn. And he, he actually has a radio show in North Louisiana. Super cool guy. And uh, I contacted him and this was a few years ago. And I said, hey, I really want to talk to you about your dad. He was like, oh, yeah, yeah. So I went up, went up into North Louisiana and I met him. And he, he bless his heart, he brought me this huge folder of like pictures and anything he could find relating to the wolf and his dad, you know, his dad's history with the wolf here in Louisiana. And um, we had such a, a nice conversation. He told me some fantastic stories, which I do have recorded and I'm, I am working on, on getting that out soon. But uh, this is one of, of Doc Harris's photographs um, that he allowed me to take home and scan. So yeah, look Glenn up, Glenn, Glenn Harris in Louisiana. He's got, so he's, he's a, he writes a column as well, like a sportsman column, column in uh, Louisiana. He's got a really wonderful story of when his dad took him out wolf hunting at one time, like he and his brother. This is, you know, like in the 40s. Um, it's an excellent story and uh, he's an excellent writer. So do look that up. So here's another black wolf. Once again, it kind of shows the size of that animal. This is 1949. So this is two years after we started that, that predator control uh, program here in Louisiana. And I'm, I'm about to get into kind of why we started that. But this is also, a, I wish we had the original picture of this. Um, this is all I've been able to find so far, but uh, still a pretty impressive photograph. So this is my favorite photograph that I have been able to find. And this was also found um, from Doc Harris. And I had found a copy of this in an old wildlife and fisheries, uh, like one of their little 
booklets that they would put out every now and then just to kind of let you know what was going on with their, you know, the program across the state. And it's from uh, 1948. And I was blown away when I pulled this out of that, that envelope that Glenn had brought me. This is eight by 10 too. And I was, I'll show, I think I even included the picture of the one I had. And I was like, oh my gosh, look, <laughs> you have the real picture. I mean, this is to me, the best picture we have of a black red wolf. This is better than Tap and Gregory's because you can see the animal's face. Yeah, his foot's in a trap, but you can actually see the animal. You can see the eyes. And because those men are standing there, you can actually see the size of that animal. Um, it's an unfortunate and it's such a sad photograph, but at the same time, like, I, you know, it was, it, I can't even explain it. it. The emotions of when I, when I found it, I just, it, it was unbelievable. It's, I was so happy, but it was also such a sad picture because this is probably the one of the only pictures we'll have of one of these black wolves looking at the camera. Um, but I'm, I have some, there we go. So that's my, just a little, I just took like a phone picture just to, to show you guys a little bit of a closer view of his face. And, he, you know, they had these amazing yellow eyes that were almost white. And uh, I could imagine seeing this animal in a, in a forest that could be um, sort of alarming. I'm not scared of wolves per se, but, you know, there's something about it in the swamp that could be a little scary. And it was really interesting, too. I was speaking to um, Chuck Hunter recently. He he is a, he works with the USFWS in Atlanta. And uh, he was telling me that he was like, yeah, you know, I was reading some of the back in, the, you know, this was several years ago, he was reading the field notes of, a, of the guy who studied the ivory bill woodpecker down here. And he, in his field notes, he actually has a note about an experience he had. This is not published, but he was sitting in, uh, he was in the, in the woods, taking his notes, probably on the, you know, the ivory bill woodpecker out there in 1936, 1937. And uh, he heard like something leaves and he looks up and there's a black wolf just staring at him. <laughs> and then when he looked at it, it ran off, but like, can you even imagine? So yeah, I thought that was kind of an interesting connection with the ivory bill. So here's like the picture I had, but also remember, that's like a blown up version of it. I had a very small picture of it, but this animal was 73 pounds, which I think is interesting to note. Um, and when I, I have a, Glenn also gave me a recording, which I'm going to be sharing soon um, in, in some different media but of his father uh, it's an interview interview bef right before he died talking about the wolf in louisiana and uh he says that the largest one he ever trapped was was 85 pounds but that one he believes had dog in it so maybe he thought that was why but other than that the largest one was 79 pounds so this was a pretty large male wolf um and just coal black and they often just had a little white patch on their chest as well so here's a few more interesting pictures from these are old like Department of Wildlife and Fishery um, periodicals that they would put out. So these are from you know, every year they would do this. And they also had like a fur animals of Louisiana book. Uh, this one here is from 1949, uh, 46 on the left. And that's um, the top picture is of a red wolf being taken out by a predator control agent. And if you look at that, that looks like a pine forest. So I guarantee you that's probably like North Louisiana, Central Louisiana. Um, the picture on the right is from 1931. It's from a book about just the fur animals of Louisiana. And the bottom animal is a black wolf, um, which I also became, I was like, there's gotta be records of that animal. We have to be able to know more about it. Um, and I did I actually found, uh, I found doc documentation in the whole story that this animal, um, this was in an area called Evangeline Parish and a hunter had killed the mother. And, and so the, had she had babies and the babies were like bare like barely a couple weeks old and uh there was this guy who he I guess he knew the hunter and he said well I, he's like let me let me let me take him I'll you know I'll take care of him I'll you know he, he felt sorry for the the babies and one survived and he kept it for a while and then when it, I think it hit probably six months old he contacted Audubon Zoo in New Orleans and said I've got this black wolf do you guys do you guys want it and they said sure so they took this one in and um I actually recently just found video footage of this animal, which was um, just a couple of days ago. I had I didn't have time to get it get it ready for this presentation, but uh, I was really excited. And it also gives you a little bit of an idea of his size. Um, they also mentioned this other animal up here being um, a gray wolf, which was they said it was in Louisiana as well. But you know, there's always going to be this. There's I, so back then they would often think of an animal as a different color and maybe a different species. So that was. Um, 
something that they often did to, to separate them. So they had this idea that there was this black wolf and then they had this idea that there was this other gray wolf in Louisiana. Okay, so this, which, let's talk a little bit about Texas. So over in Texas, um, I was able to locate some pictures. The one on the right is one of my favorite pictures aside from that other black wolf one I showed you um, of, of red wolves. So these were um, biological survey, um, I spelled that wrong, I just noticed that. Um, biological survey photos from the USDA, uh, which was, you know, this was probably, um, I think they told me, yeah, it was 1927, okay? So they went and I asked them to look for me. I gave them very specific things. Do you have pictures of this and that? And they, they, found, they did a great job of helping me out with this. And so these were a couple that I really liked um, from what they sent me. And the one on the right, um, it's really, it's hard to tell because I know it's not really close up, but that's three wolves there and they are chained. So likely these guys were trapped and I don't know, I have no, I wish I knew the context behind this. Like I wish I knew why there's three of them and why they're all chained there and what they were going to do with them. But um, they're all alive. And that's the other thing is um, I should have probably warned you guys. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the pictures we have are of dead animals or trapped animals because that was the only time they took pictures of them, right? Um, but this is a nice photograph just to be able to see what the, you know, what these guys really looked like. And then on the right, I mean, the left, uh, we've got this, what they, what, you know, what they, whoever took this picture in 1927 said that this was a typical Texas red wolf or timber wolf. So they also called them timber wolves. So if you ever read old documents or, or if you ever hear me say that, or if I'm, you know, writing something or they sometimes called them timber wolves or, you know, black timber wolf, um, and then they also had like the Texas red wolf. Um, some people thought that they were different. Um, Goldman thought that it was just, they were subspecies of one species. That's a big chunky boy there on the left. Um, that one reminds me a lot of the wolves in North Carolina as well. So if we look back at some of these Louisiana biennial, biennial reports and the fur take port reports, um, we see that there's, there's always been a little area for fox foxes and wolves and, and civet cats. And um, that, um, that section's never been huge, obviously. Like, I mean, foxes, there's been times where they had, foxes had their own little section, but I mean, you know, lumping them all together, there were still like, for instance, in 1913, you know, 4,500 or whatever that were taken, right? It's not a ton compared to look at, you know, muskrats, right? Um, but this is an interesting chart just to kind of see from like, you see 1913, you know, all the way over, keep, keep, you know, keep looking, but that number starts to, it goes really high in, in 1916, it goes up to 13,000 and then it drops back down. Um, and then what happens is when you look down on that next row, 1919, you see, you know, 2,300, nothing for the, I don't know why in 1920 there was nothing, but the number starts to drop again. And then over there on the very last end of that, that second call, I mean, the second row is 1924. There's only 947. And then the next year, like there's not even a, a spot for them. Like there's just not a spot. I, I, my assumption is that it probably, there were so few that they were taking, they just threw them into, you know, miscellaneous. Uh, and the numbers probably just kept dwindling. However, in the 1920s, interestingly enough, in a lot of newspaper articles and things like that, that I've come across there, there wasn't like a, a bit of, um, a resurgence of red wolves or these wolves that were coming in and into the 30s. So when we look at that, we here's one, you know just an example of one that was in a report. Um, they talk about you know in in Texas, you know they're talking about uh, you know a red wolf that had apparently killed 200 lambs. I don't really believe that, but um, they had these you know this other very last sentence there. They talk about you know the 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 three parishes of north central louisiana became so severe by 1939 that the local cattle and hog industry was practically forced out of existence so there is i mean this is just kind of the tail end of that but this um this is important and it's problematic because wh whatever was causing that um that growth or whatever the growth population growth of the of the wolves or even if it was a population growth um, i think i believe Nowak said that in the twenties, he, he had kind of linked it to, we were cutting more woods and we, so their habitat was sort of, you know, dwindling. And so that was bringing them in to all these farms and, th and there were more farms being set up. So really it may not have actually been that their population was growing. It, it was just that they were, 
they were being seen more and they were, they were starting to have more conflict with humans, just part of, you know, the farming industry coming in and then part of, you know, their habitat just starting to get slowly more and more uh, taken away from them. So that this right here in the nights, like 1939, 1940, um, it, people started like panicking and they wanted, well, they wanted them all killed. And so of course that, you know, is what eventually caused Louisiana to start this predator control program. Before then they would, they had a lot of bounties, um, not tons in Louisiana, but we did have some states that did. But you can see here in like 1944, 1945, I mean, it does mention that in the Singer Preserve and that's where the ivory bill woodpecker was and all those pictures of the black wolf that I was telling you about earlier was Tappan Gregory were taken. And that's up in the North and it's talking about how it's, you know, it's got this great sanctuary and it's got all these game birds. And then it does mention in there, um, that uh where is it i'm sorry the very top it says you know, there's a few wolves and, and coyotes may be found which i thought was a very interesting a very interesting sentence i did not expect them to mention anything about coyotes and that you know in the 40s um but they knew there was something else coming there's a couple of there's a couple of uh instances of even in the late 30s where they mention oh there's that big timber wolf we have but there's also this this new wolf from Texas coming in. And I tend to think that that was probably the hybrids that were coming in and probably some coyotes as well. Um, so they were still around, but there was still confusion a little bit about what they might be, these other animals that were coming in. So we can see here in Louisiana in 1947 to 1950, um, there were a hundred wolves killed. And that's a lot of, I mean, a lot of wolves that were killed for a, a you know population that was dwindling, um, I think it's probably there could have probably been there probably were hybrids um, that people were just thinking were wolves. Um, they were coming in from the Red River in the north, the north uh, west area from from over from Arkansas and and um, Texas, and so this was for me an interesting thing to find here. Um, this is not just the only instance. I just I didn't want to bore you guys with a thousand different ones, but this is just one one example of that. So what happened in 1947 was they went ahead and they started that program, that predator program. And this picture right here, that's Dr. Doc Harris. So that's uh, T.E. Harris. That's Glenn's dad, who I was telling you guys about earlier. Um, I love these old pictures. But anyway, this is you know one of the very first uh, ones you would have caught for the state. Uh, and this animal, my eyesight is so bad. I can't see what it is. Was it 70? No, 60 pounds. Yeah, 60 pounds. Um, now, I also want to say, like, back then, you know, if you ever hear Dr. and you'll hear, because I have got recordings about this, and I've talked to Glenn, and I interviewed him, but these, these trappers, I mean, they really felt, they felt that they were doing um, a good thing. And, and he talks about this, too. It's, you know, they were, they were helping provide a service for, for people who were struggling. Okay, so, and, and these guys, they didn't just go in and just kill any wolf. You know, he talks about this. He said, you know, I made sure if I were to take an animal out, he said, I made sure that it was the animal that was causing the damage, you know? And, and at the time, you know, I have to say too, like Doc Harris, he knew this man was, he was, he was one of the first ones in the state to say, you know what? I, I, we're not seeing that many wolves anymore. Like we, we need to lay off. And he actually told his men to stop killing wolves if you catch them he said let me know and he literally would uh he actually released a few which is amazing to me like he took them out of the problem area and did i mean he did this all kind of like under the radar but he he recognized it because he was on the ground and he was seeing what was being caught and he knew before anybody else knew that these animals the the you know the original red wolf uh he knew those numbers were dwindling and so um I can't wait to be able to share share the, those interviews with you guys. Um, it's just fascinating when you really get to hear about what what these guys were seeing, you know, and not just what we know from the few papers that had come out from uh, these these are these other fellows that were studying them. So that's Doc Harris, and what we see happen from 1947 on in Louisiana. And this is such a neat graphic. This whole article, and this is from a, a report of Louisiana, you can look this up. It's from 1948, 1949, biannual report. And it talks about, you know, from the 1700s on, like what happened to the wildlife. And this is sort of their chart talking about it. And um, I mean, you know, 
if you think so the 18 you know 1800s we had these things coming we had the the industry here we had cotton we would they would clear cut things they would get rid of habitat to for the you know cotton and and we had uh, tobacco and that type of thing and then we had uh you know the, the logging industry which came in in the, the latter part of the later part of like 18 no probably pretty late 1800 that really did a number and and you can see these you know if, if you're looking at you know that timeline on the bottom you can start to see where it really falls okay and so you know we also then like we mentioned earlier we had these these issues with the deer and all that kind of stuff as well and you can even see here where that deer number drops dramatically look at that up like tonight like so early like 1920s like that number like really plummeted um and you know back then they didn't care about they didn't they wanted the predators gone they didn't care about the predators they just wanted game animal and so that's just not them not really understanding I, you know in their mind it was the with no predators is the best way to go right so if you look here at the the report on the on the right um they talk about uh 85 wolves being killed in in you know um, 48 49 no mention yet of coyotes although uh, Glenn does not Glenn. I'm sorry. T. E. Harris does mention in a few reports that he he was pretty sure that they were already in the state by 1947. Okay, so oops. Okay, went the wrong way. Okay, so this is from um, a 1949 report. So after they started that predator control program, they started to put out little um, like every year they would put a little section in in their in their reports and T. E. Harris would write, do a little write up on it and kind of let you guys, you know, everybody know what, what they were up to and what they had done over the year. And um, at the time we had a horrible, horrible feral dog um, issue. And they really, and he even says this a few times, the feral dogs in Texas and Louisiana were unbelievable. There's a lot of hunting dogs that just would, you know, they would just go live in the woods basically. And they would, they would do a number on the livestock. And there's several of these fellas who said, look, there, there was one, those were not wolves that were killing your sheep or whatever. Those were feral dogs. And the feral dogs would come in and kill them and they wouldn't even eat them. They would just would cause havoc. So you can find so much uh, documentation on this. It's really interesting. But that's what that animal is in that top, that top uh, left picture. Although they call it a wolf in here, but it's a dog. And then you see here the one on the right top was a... They call it, um, this is one of my favorite images just because they, they, they kind of show these two different animals. They say, uh, so the wolf on the top right, um, and that's Hosea Elliott. He was, a, um, he was one of the, their predator control officers. Um, he had that wolf trapped in an area called West Bay in Allen Parish. And that's sort of, that's kind of like, it's not north at all. It's like central, kind of more south central. Um, and then you see below that, that big picture, it says this is the you know, typical specimen of wolf found in various sections of Louisiana. So that those animals look too, they look very different to me. And that was the animal, the one on the bottom is the one that they were seeing more and more of. It wasn't that top one, which looks to me more like that old black, the black wolf, right? So my hunch is that that bottom one is probably a hybrid that was moving its way in from Texas. And then we see in 19, uh, so that that's how it kind of continues. So so from this, you know, 1950s into the right before like 58 or so, they just do a lot of predator control. They're just knocking them out. And um, we see in 1958, uh, this mention here, and this is actually one of those reports written by uh, Doc Harris. And he's, he says in here, um, you know, the wolves, their numbers are, their numbers are up. Um, let's see what that is, sorry. I would definitely go back and read this after, but um, if we look at yeah, the numbers are right here. So we've got, he says in 19, I can't read that, 58, was it, is it 50? And then it goes 60. So the total for, you know, from 1958 and 59 was 100 and 110, okay? So, you know, he's talking about uh, these wolves that are, you know, being, they're being detrimental. He also mentions in here that we have um, a, a new, a new animal, a new migrant, he called it, from Texas coming in, a new wolf. So that was one of the very first places that I found that, that he was aware now that there was something else coming in. 
And I'm just going to jump to these real quick, just to kind of let you know what was going on at the time. So this is um, just from a 1977 document on the left here, but this is showing what was going on in Texas. So in you know, pre-1930, this is what they thought was going on. So that very, the, the, let's see. So this area here, they didn't know that was, it was like this dead zone for a while in some of those areas. Whoops. And uh, that's when they think that this hybridization started. Okay. So they, they, they did a number on, on these predators in this area. It was absent of like predators for a while or can canids. And um, they think possibly that's what maybe caused, um, it broke down, I guess, that barrier that would have been, you know, between red wolves and coyotes. And so they see, you know, if you, you look at pre-1930s, that's what's going on there. But then you see in 1942, I mean, that's only 12 years later, they believe that this whole area on the, you know, on the east was just becoming basically, it was like a hybrid, that's they call it a hybrid swarm. And they were just sort of taking over and it was moving. Okay. And not only were their hybrids, but it was also coyotes. Um, this doesn't really show coyotes, but we know now that it was coyotes as well. There are some that just look like Western coyotes. And I'm sure that they, if you were to do their DNA, I'm sure that would come up as that as well. And so that's sort of what, what was going on in Texas at this time. And this is, um, I wish this was a better image, but this shows in 1959, this is one of the wildlife sur surveys, an inventory they did. And this is showing wolf in, in the cougar range. So they're, they're thinking it's just up in this North area. They're not talking about the coast yet. Okay. And I have, I have a recording of Doc Harris talking about, he later found out that uh, there were wolves down there. You know, he's got old documents of like, you know, these old like alligator poachers talking about it. Um, but at the time, they didn't know. They just didn't think they were down there. So in 1961, and this is where I think the sad part really, to me, I just think this is so unfortunate. But you start to see these, these comments about the wolf, in, you know, in former years, it probably ranged over here and here. And, you know, but yeah, they were in trouble for a while, but they were never truly, you know, major, you know, majorly um, populous, but guess what? Their numbers are on the rise. So this even says, you know, their numbers are, they're, they're increasing. And so there was this idea in 1961 that these animals were increasing that, oh my gosh, all of a sudden the red wolf is just, yeah, he's the Louisiana wolf. It's coming back. And so that was, that was what people thought. And so you start to see this, you know, the people going out and just killing them like left and right. And they were, they started hiring, they were parishes, which are counties, they would hire trappers and say, you, you know, you're our trapper. We want you to go kill any wolf out there. And um, so in 1962 and 63, these are the parishes where they were killing them. And, you know, that's, you know, that number like 162 or so. I mean, that's, that's pretty high if, if those were actually red wolves, okay? And then we see, this is a guy, there's a lot on him. Um, his name was Clyde Williams and he lived up in North Louisiana and he, uh, they, this parish hired him. He was their parish trapper and he would go out and kill. Now this guy, he was convinced that there was no, he was like that hybrid stuff is baloney. These are all wolves. All I mean, even into like the late sixties, like even after like wildlife fishers were like, no man, they're they're hybrids and there's coyotes. Like, no, 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 they're wolves. So there was a lot of this like it was like a battle. Like some people who who thought they were wolves did not want to believe otherwise. And I, I it was interesting to me. But there's a lot you can find a lot of um, articles, newspaper articles, if anybody's into that, on this guy. And there's some really great pictures of him um, and these animals. Um, but you know, this was you know him just trapping you know twenty so far in the year, you know, but he, there's, yeah, he trapped a lot in that area. So there were, put it this way, they were so numerous that he was trapping them enough to where he could line them up. It looks like he did that in a week, right? So once again, we see this, we see 1962, 174 wolves, 162. I mean, this is down from, if you look at the numbers in the forties, it was like, there might be a year that's like, there's 10 wolves that were taken or six, okay? This is happening at the same time over in Texas, um, 1962. This is another one of my favorite pictures just because look at the, that black animal. And he even says the thing, I showed this to Ron Nowak and he said to me, you know, this even shows that back then there was still a lot of confusion about what these animals were. And like, 
because the hybrids were, you know, they were moving in. And so they weren't that different looking. They were F1 hybrids, most likely, or, you know, much more than they would be now. So they were bigger. And, uh, you know, he, this guy even says in here, he says, well, you know, the black one is definitely like a, a, that's a real black wolf. And he, you know, and if you look at the head on that thing compared to the other, the other one could have been a, a hybrid for all we know. But I like this article because it, it does point to the fact that they weren't real sure. You know, he just says, uh, it's a pure wolf. It's definitely a pure wolf. And he says, uh, the animal has a typical wolf-like head, feet, and tail. So uh, another picture that I was really excited to find just because it does really show that difference and what was going on in, this is East Texas in a place called um, Tyler, uh, Winona. So if you want to look that up on a map, you can see where it is. So then what we see happen, and this is the super unfortunate part, is that finally in 1964, they realized, oh, wait, those weren't wolves. Those were like coyotes we were killing. Like the wolves are gone. They're already gone. And they actually made it, they make a comment about this. It says, in the past, we have listed wolves among predators taken, which are in reality coyotes. And this was happening for like, you know, almost two decades. And so, you know, 20 years, they realize that, oh, wow, we've been killing these other, you know, these animals taking their wolves and now the wolves is really gone. And so this was when finally, you know, this was right before, I think by right after um, T.E. Harris had already put out like a, it was not official, but it was like this unofficial, like, don't kill any more wolves uh, request among his men. And uh, by this time, though, like, this is once, like, the scientific community at this point knew in 1962. But, uh, yeah, so you see the numbers. Look at that. So you start going up. And every year after this, you see those coyote numbers going up. Um, and there's no, there's no more mention of wolves anymore after 1964 in Louisiana, pretty much in these reports at least. And so then you start to see them including the coyote in, in all of their literature and pamphlets and everything that they put out there, all their publications. And they talk about it being, you know, this migrant coming in from uh, Texas. And there's even, you know, they start showing pictures of people showing these, now they are like, oh, here's the first coyotes that were trapped in this, this parish or whatever. And so this would have been in Natchitoches parish. So put it this way, these two coyotes were trapped um, in the same parish where that the one with the young boy, that big that same, that's the same parish. So basically they moved in and they, they just supplanted them. Um, so it's just, it's really sad because it, you know, you just, you just want to say, oh, they only knew, you know, if they just only knew, we, you know, in, in just, just two decades, you know, earlier, if we would have known, maybe we could have done something. And so this sort of just takes us to this point now where they're gone from they're gone from the north of Louisiana. They're gone from most of East Texas, even central. Like, you know, maybe, of course, there's probably pockets of them still around. But at, by this time, by the 60s, I mean, we had all these roads and interstates put in. Interstate 10 came in. Um, you know, that that was a, a, probably a big issue because they, they realized, at, you know, in 1965 or so, there was probably not anything. No, there were no wolves north of... Uh, interstate 10 they were all south and that's when they started to realize they were down in this coastal area okay so this and really if you look in the literature there's or, or any of the reports government reports or state reports even the newspapers are really they didn't mention wolves that often down on the coast of louisiana but in 1960 this is an article from 1960 and this is about uh you know they were all of a sudden they've got wolves again and this this article is great it even mentions here um these animals were about 30 inches tall, which is correct for a red wolf, about 80 pounds. There were four of them in this group that they, they had state trappers trap. Um, so they said the trappers came out Monday. Um, and it says the trappers who have you know, caught wolves all over the state said that these wolves were different from the others that they had been taking, but they believed them to be the Louisiana timber wolves. So the thing that these were, this animal that you're looking at, is one of the ones that so T T Harris's guys T said don't kill it like let's bring it back so they it even says in here they took it because it was going to be studied what they did was they went and they took it up to North Louisiana and they they released it because these were this I mean these they, these were wolves these were not what these guys had been trapping which were these smaller hybrids and so I think it's interesting because obviously the trap this threw these trappers off they were like what is what is this you know um, 
And it also says in there, you know, back, I think it says a number of them, a number of wolves were caught in the Gum Cove area in the northern part of Cameron Parish several years ago. That gives me the chills because that takes us to this study that uh, Dr. Kristen Bresky and Dr. Bridget Von Holt and Dr. Joey Henton have just started uh, out here in Louisiana. That's where they are. They're doing a lot of their, putting a lot of efforts into that Gum Cove area in Cameron Parish. And so um, that's sort of where I, I had to stop. I would have loved to have just gone on and on, but I said, well, maybe we can do a part two and I can, I can, you know, do a, another section on, on the Southeast. I mean, the Southwest, I'm sorry, in Southeast uh, Red Wolf of Texas and Louisiana, because this, this is where it, it does take a, a sort of a hopeful turn. I mean, it's sad. That's where they, they were now, you know, restricted to, but it's also where we started this program um, to recover them. And that's it for today. But um, I have been following Dr. Joey and uh, I was out with him in the field and I've been documenting his work down here on the coast and, and working with Kristen and, and Bridget as well. And so I started a website to, to start sort of uh, just so I can share that that information that we are documenting. And uh, there's a lot right now that I'm still trying to get processed and done, but there's, there is information there right now. You can also read some of these studies that they've been working on. Um, and there's some good links to papers and stuff like that as well, and some images. Um, and Joey and I started a podcast, um, which I, I totally misspelled that y'all, I'm so sorry. Um, it's just the Canid Project. We just, um, released uh, the first episode last last week. So we are going to be talking a lot about all of this, the history. We're, we're going to interview uh, some of these these guys who've worked with these animals in the past. Um, and and we'll discuss the project of what's going on right now and what they're planning to do with these animals uh, down here on the coast and in Texas. So uh, do try to find that. And you can also find the Red Wolf Project on Facebook and Instagram as well. And uh, I'm trying to just post as much as I can with that. As we were working on this project, um, we've got a lot more planned. And uh, if you have any questions, let me know. But I think I think Joey's here. He's going to we're going to do a, a question and answer Q&A. Yay. Yeah. So okay. thank you so much, Amy. Um, this is so interesting. Just seeing just all these images from so long ago and and just all the loss in terms of information and, and unfortunately those lives. Yeah. Um, but uh, so before we take any questions, I just want to um, take some time to remind people uh, what uh, we've been listening to and watching um, if they joined after our, the introduction. And we are here with Amy Shutt from the uh, Canid Project who just finished a presentation to discuss uh, the history of red wolves in Louisiana and Texas and all the historical clues and treasures you discovered in the archival reports, including you know, overlooked uh, newspaper accounts and unpublished correspondence to really shed light on how red wolves uh, lived there, um, but also how they disappeared. So we're also here, as you mentioned, with Dr. Joey Hinton, who has been working with Amy, and uh, he's here to discuss some of the current genetic and um, morphometric research happening on the canids of the coastal Southeast. And um, if you do have questions, if you could just type them into the Q&A box in your control panel. Um, and I think I just want to start with, um, you know, I think a big theme of uh, a lot of this presentation and, and just a lot of these images has been these, these black um, phase uh, red wolves, which um, I'd never even heard of one until I met you, Amy, I guess it was mm -hmm. back in, in March or April or May, sometime in the spring. And um, and just wondering if Joey could could you tell us a little bit more about why um, what sort of advantage um, uh, these wolves are could have with that uh, that dark coat? Yeah. Um, hey everyone. Yeah. This is this is Joey Hinton. So uh, yeah. So so the the melan so black black coat color melanism and and wolves is pretty rare it's, it's predominantly a, a north american thing um eurasian gray wolves um you don't you don't find um black wolves out out in that area or that region of the world um there's a few isolated cases where you have some melanism pop up maybe in, in indian wolves or, or some italian wolves or something like that and, and pretty quickly there's a there's a natural history paper published on it and they can do that because it's it's pretty rare. 
But here in North America, um, melanism is, is kind of common in, in gray wolf populations along the boreal forest areas of the continent. Um, I think in Yellowstone, they've made up like close to 50% of the population at times. But um, in the southeastern US, um, the red wolf population there, melanism, that is black animals were, were quite common. But as you can tell from Amy's um, presentation that uh, the populations were eradicated pretty quickly that we never really were able to, to quantify um, how common they were. But um, down in Louisiana, they were commonly referred to as like the black timber wolf. Um, Goldman tried to reclassify, re rename the red wolf Canis Niger to, to emphasize how common black animals were in, in, uh, in its historic range. Um, and, uh, and the first and only photographs of wild red wolves in Louisiana by Gregory up in the Tinsall River area were, um, were black animals. Um, and so that, that black coat color was, was quite common, probably around that Mississippi Basin area and out to Florida and probably parts of Georgia and whatnot. Um, the benefit for, for that is probably because they're in, um, they call it crypsis, you know, basically it's a dark animal living in a dark environment. And so it probably allows it some camouflage. Um, it may conceal it so it can hunt deer better, um, or it could provide in terms of modern day technology, uh, some, 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 some um, concealment from humans and, and being shot at and stuff like that. And so there's a benefit there for, for that reason. Um, so that, that's one thing. Um, the other, I, yeah, that, that, that's probably the main, the main, um, the main benefit for it would be, would be concealment. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a uh, eco geographic rule called like the Glogger's rule, which um, it's, it's pretty, pretty widespread taxonomically that, that shows that basically the black coat color or black color for it, any type of birds, mammals, whatever, um, tends to increase in these sort of wet, humid, um, very canopy dense environments. Um, and and it, it's for a wide range of things. It could be anything from like benefit <clears throat> for immune systems, um, benefit for concealment, survival. It, it, so it's been linked to aggressiveness. I think in gray wolves, they've linked um, black coat color with aggressive behavior. So sometimes the animals could be more dominant, um, but we just haven't pinpointed it. Because we don't know much about it in red wolves because the phenotype is now extinct. Um, there's no telling what it was there for, uh, but it's now there in the, the coyote population and the hybrid population in North Carolina. And we have a paper that will get submitted here in, a, in probably a few weeks that looked at it. And we saw um, increased selection for um, wetlands and, uh, and, and forested areas, areas with dense canopy cover. Um, the black animals were choosing those areas more often than the gray animals were, and they had incurred higher survival rates. And so our, our assumption here is, is that the animals are just um, selecting for these, these canopy dense areas. There's probably some benefit there for hunting and, and catching things, but they decided that the, the sort of benefit they have today is, is higher survival. Humans don't see them. And so they probably um, do better in those environments. If they're caught out in open areas like agricultural grassland areas, they probably get seen and pretty conspicuous and shot and stuff like that. So the long answer is that's, that's probably the benefit that we have right now for them. Sorry, <laughs> I know it was a long answer, but that's that's what I got for that one. <laughs> that's fine, Joey. No, thank you. And actually, this is kind of um, a follow up. Um, you know, I think when looking at all of these these old photos, um, again, Amy, there have been so many positive comments just about all the work you've done to dig all these up. I don't okay. know if if anyone's put any of these things together ever before, but this is really a, a great resource. Um, but I think one of the things just for me personally, um, looking at all of these pictures of, of red wolves from so many decades ago, uh, beyond them being in a position where they were not in a good place, they're either trapped or, or going to die, but was really just looking at them and thinking of the loss um, mm -hmm. in terms of the genetics. Um, because as we know, uh, the founding population of all the uh, red wolves on the planet today comes from just a limited amount and really what, what those animals might have had um, that could provide um, for healthier red wolves today if they were still around. And someone is asking kind of related to this, um, is it possible that existing red wolves could produce a black offspring through mut a mutation or is that genetic lineage that's likely gone forever? 
Uh, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll handle that question again. Yeah. Um, if you, if you got something to say to me, otherwise I'll, I'll take it. Uh, Go ahead. Okay. So right now, no, we're not seeing, um, red wolves produce black wolves. Um, it's the, the black phenotype, the black coat color is tied to that K loci. Um, so we know where it comes from and that, that sort of K loci is, is what triggers, I think, black coat color in, in all mammals. And so it's actually quite common. Um, so what we've seen in North Carolina, where we do have wild red wolves interacting with coyotes, um, there has been a production of um, black hybrids. And so it seems like the, how, how it's triggered, we don't know yet. Um, the issue that we have in North Carolina is that the hybrids are sterilized, so are coyotes. And so a lot of the reproduction is pretty much halted and interfered with. So we, we can't get the nice pedigree outside the wolf lineage, like you see maybe in Yellowstone or something like that, where you can follow, you know, all the offspring and who's reproducing and who's not and what happens. Um, but the first, the first situation I saw in North Carolina where a black hybrid popped up, it was from what the records show, it was a female wolf breeding with a gray coyote. And then they, I think they had a mixed litter of, of black and gray things. Um, and there's been a couple litters like that. It looks like it's female biased. It looks like uh, the black things are usually females. And then they, they, if they get a chance to go breed, they'll produce more black things. Um, when you have these mixed litters, um, the gray things come out, you know, with less wolf ancestry than the black things do. It's kind of odd. I Wait, say that again. Say that again. The what? The, the ancestry and the pups are different from what I've seen that in the raw data. Uh, that's going to have to be Kristen Bridget that addressed okay. this. I'm not a geneticist. But yeah, you'll have like, you know, you'll have like a wolf or a coyote. Or you have two, a black thing and a gray thing, and they'll produce a litter of five animals, maybe two animal, two of the pups are black and the other three are gray. Um, if they're F1s or if they're, F, if say they're F2s, uh, the black things will come out as F1s and then the, the gray things will come out oh, as F2s. I see, Whatever. I, I didn't understand that. I, I, I had asked Kristen and Bridget about that and I, we haven't really discussed it yet. We'll get, we'll get on that down the road, but, um, I, but I can, what we're seeing, oh, oh sorry. So what we're no. seeing though with, with melanism is that with, I mean, we've handled hundreds of coyotes and in hybrids and they're actually not common maybe about seven percent of all the coyotes that we've handled have been black and i think like eight or nine percent of all the hybrids that we've handled have been black which is interesting because black coat colors and red wolves are quite common and so you have this widespread coyote throughout the southeast that is carrying this k loci in its population it has it has the mutation it has the ability to produce black individuals but there isn't a super strong selection for it like you did like you saw with red wolves and so i'm assuming right now the coyotes are probably having some small benefit from being black and that you know provides higher survival in these 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 uh canopy dense areas and and, and whatnot but for the wolf maybe being black had other benefits like hunting deer and, and being concealed in that way especially at night and so maybe there's a body size interaction with blackness in these populations if the coyotes got larger and maybe they were like you know 45 50 60 pounds maybe you would see a higher proportion of populations being black because they would have they would be more capable of killing deer or something like that but we're just not seeing not seeing the commonness of black um that that black coat color is not it's just not as frequent as it was in the red wolf population also with the um with the with the i have so i should have included them but maybe i'll do a whole other presentation on them with joey but I have a ton of pictures of black um, coyotes that popped up in the Southeast from, from the forties on. Yeah. And, in Oklahoma. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah. Like Oklahoma. Oh yeah. Oklahoma. Oh, had yeah. It, but I mean, but not just that they, but there's different, there's, there's a true coal black, like, you know, version, right. That has, and they're black, like truly black with that white chest patch. But yep. then there's these other ones, like I've even, I, I mean, I, I've collected a couple to send to Bridget. Um, they look black when you look at them, but really when you look at them up close and in, in a good light, they're just, they're dark. They're really dark, you know? Mm -hmm. So there's variation in that black, how black it gets. But, um, but a lot of the red wolves that I've seen, the pictures that I've seen of them, they're, they're that most of them, when they're black, they're truly coal black. Yeah. Also, yeah. They did have like even Ron Novak, he sent me some pictures of some that he had found in collections. It's almost like they're red, but when you look at them under like tree, under like canopy or in its shade, mm -hmm. they look like coal black. 
Yeah. But when you get them in the sun, they're not. So I don't, it's interesting because I'm sure there's all this variation in that too. But if anybody's interested, I do have pictures I can send anybody of like those cold black ones that were even Monroe, Louisiana had a pair that they thought were red wolves. This was in like the fifties, but they, they realized they were coyotes or hybrids. I've got some pictures of those guys too. Um, but anyway, Joe, yeah, Joey, your paper, I can't wait for that to come out. Um, Cause that covers all this too, right? Pretty much. I mean, yeah, not the genetic component, um, just mostly just the field data. Yeah. Um, survival space use habitat selection stuff like that but uh yeah i mean um as far as the genetic stuff i mean that's that's gonna have to be a, a, another project but that i mean the, it's hard because the there's so few black things yeah. that the sample sizes aren't there so it's hard to make strong inferences off your data so i mean we'll see i mean it's gonna happen i mean over time collecting lots and lots of data we'll, we'll hit that threshold and there'll be something there on the genetic side but um but yeah, it's it's the other thing too with the the coyotes is you get the strawberry blonde stuff too. Yeah, yeah. You don't you don't have that with red wolves, and that's not a historic thing with red wolves, and that so the the, the coyote just has picked up a wide range of color, um, coming east and and, and breeding with wolves. You know, so. Yeah, and there's another really good question here, um, and Amy, maybe you can cover this one: is why didn't more pelts and skeletons survive? Um, the pre-coyote black and red wolves from the Gulf Coast. And is there a chance that some museum or a state in Europe or another place could have a collection that could be helpful? I know where they all are. <laughs> unless, unless they're in, unless they're in like being hidden somewhere in like a personal collection, like anybody can find what collections they're in across the United States. The problem is, is that um, really they were, they were considered fairly rare by even like 1850 okay like that audubon says they were not that common and they weren't really they weren't collecting that much for science science back then until you know till the Smithsonian really started and so at that point yeah they did have the biological survey guys go out and they would they would send stuff back to the to the museum but before that all these ranchers and stuff that killed them and all these hunters they just shot them and killed them didn't care they just threw them away there was no you know it's kind of like coyotes think about that right now think about how many people hunt coyotes nowadays and if you look at you can find pictures there's hundreds piles of them people don't they just throw them away they don't give a shit and i'm so sorry <laughs> they don't care and so the, you know how many of those actually get sent to a, mu a museum you know so i mean it, it's, a, it's a sign of the times as well but it's unfortunate because i mean you look at alabama there's literally two like that's it in all of alabama, alabama that we can find because also they were also i think alabama like they were pretty much gone by like 1930 or something and florida they were gone by like 1910 so it's in those southeast t places where they were really seen uh early on like you know late 1800s that there's really not there's just they just threw them away or they were in personal personal collections which who knows what happened to all of those taxidermied animals you know i found a few but not many Ugh. i know i know it just it so yeah. sad um and you know there's some questions here people uh they're hooked on you and they um <laughs> are wondering what what's next what are, what else are you doing via the canid project well, this is like my big, this is my big project because actually the, the reason that I, the reason I got interested in this was because I, I came across those two melanistic black coyotes that I was talking about. Um, so uh, I've been documenting coyotes and, and wolves with these wolves for a while now. So like I said, Joey and I, we have this podcast going, I'm trying to get the story and I was, I've been trying to find really nice vehicles through media to, to tell the story, right? Because I have so much information and I have so much data and, and you know, pictures and that I want to share. And um, so we're trying a few different avenues. I think that, um, you know, I've, I've got this, the documentary part of it that I've been working on for a while. And that is going to be like a multimedia type of experience. It won't just be like a documentary film. Um, but that's, that's just going to take me a while. But in the meantime, I'm going to be putting out just small, smaller little like two and four minute, uh, like kind of they're kind of going to be like little journals a bit, you know, like kind of showing, uh, mixing together this history with what I was doing out on the coast with Joey and with Kristen and Bridget. I went up and visited Bridget in North, uh, I mean, New Jersey. And that's where I met you, Maggie. I went up to New York. So I'm trying to get these in and in, in, in small, you know, little digestible nuggets that I can let, you know, so that way I can share it in that way to everybody. Um, and I, I hope to continue, um, you know, documenting uh, these guys. So there's some really interesting and really, really exciting stuff that's going to be happening with this project of Kristen and Bridget and Joey's uh, soon. 
and I don't know what I can say about it or not, so I'm not going to say anything, but I'm hoping to be able to continue with the documentation to let you guys know, like the public. I think the public needs to know this stuff. And so that's really what my, that's what my purpose is, is to get this information out to everybody so that they can understand it and know what's going on. Um, but that, yeah, that's, that's what, it, that's what the Canaan, I mean, that's what's up with the Canaan project right now is really focusing on that primarily. Well, it's really cool. And uh, Joey, I don't know if we referenced it a whole bunch, like um, Kristen and, and Bridget. I don't know if you just want to quickly speak to what they're up to and what you're doing with them. Oh, yeah, um, I can do that. Okay. Yeah. So um, this, this, what we're doing, we have a Fish and Wildlife Service funded project to survey the Canet populations along Southwest Louisiana's coast down there in that area that Amy was talking about where she, where she finished up in, in uh, the Cameron Parish and I think Cameron Prairie Parish and Jefferson Davis Parish in those areas. Um, the, the point of the project is basically to go down into those area in those areas where we last, where we caught the last remaining wild red wolves and uh, survey those coyotes, catch them, draw blood from them, send them up to Bridges Live in Princeton, radio collar the wolves, um, and then cut them loose and, and not wolves, but the coyotes and, and the hybrids and, and study their behavior and whatnot. Um, the reason is, is because they, they probably didn't catch all the wolves that we, we definitely have animals behind. And so the, those, those coyote populations along the coast there are, are quite different. And so what we want to do is, is actually see how red wolf ancestry in the canid populations of those areas are influencing their, their ecology. And then, I mean, it obviously via you know, their genetics and their morphology. Um, those animal, those, those populations are quite unique in their, you know, what they look like and how they behave and whatnot. And so it, it would help us figure out as we move forward with the red wolf recovery efforts throughout their historic range um, to tie red wolf ancestry to certain landscape characteristics to show where these last remaining wolves were at and, and how they were able to survive into the 70s um, to be caught and whatnot. And so it's, it's beneficial in that way. Um, where it goes from there, we don't know. I mean, right now we have a pretty good sized study area in Southwest Louisiana. Mm -hmm. Kristen is heading a project on Galveston Island in Texas, south, Southeast Texas. Um, and they, they have stuff going on there. I think the goal eventually is to connect the two study areas. Basically, if we can jump the Louisiana border into Texas, that big thicket area and use the, I guess mm -hmm. the, uh, the, the wildlife refuge complex there too along the coast there and just keep maintain a, a long-term study um, and really and, and narrow down like what, what happened there and, and how the animals differ from the surrounding region and, you know, stuff like that. Um, and then hopefully that information then could be used to inform Red, Red Wolf recovery, you know, um, elsewhere, you know, in, in their historic range. So that's, that's where we're at right now. So it's a new project just getting started. And, and also I just want to add to that. The great thing about which really just to me, it was like, um, I don't know if, I don't know, it was just very, um, it was like serendipitous, but um, there, there is an area and I did actually go and I, I did a formal interview with uh, the land manager out there uh, yesterday, but I decided I, it would have, I would have been another, it would have been another two hour, <laughs> um, two hour presentation if I were to add that part on, but uh, the area that they're studying in, in Southwest Louisiana, part of that study area is a huge, uh, a huge plot of land that has always been free of hunting and predator control since 18, since 1918. And it's, it's still owned by the same family. And, um, they, that was the la literally the last place that, uh, the red wolves were in Louisiana on, like they were found on that land. Okay. And so we were able to, uh, to get back with them now they, that land is now set aside it's like a, it's a foundation now and, and and they they still are you know the same philosophy and they are really um they were really into helping the you know the wolves survive in that area at the time and they're really into it now and so i think that's going to be a, a really interesting part of this story that um i hope we get to talk about really soon um because it's it's kind of that whole full circle thing you know it's coming back around to where these founders are from and, and that, and the people who helped, you know, probably, you know, you're looking at several thousand acres helped to, uh, to 
protect them, you know, even if it was, you know, not, they weren't, they were basically just not allowing any killing on that property, but that was the safe haven for these animals. So I think that'll be really interesting when we are able to start looking more into that too, in the animals yeah. that are there now, you know? Yeah. I was, I was the first, I was the, f- the first time that property, when I got down there, I was the first time that property was trapped in what, yep. like 50 years, 60 years. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It, it's, yeah. It's pretty, I mean, it's a pretty unique pretty spot. Unique. And, um, yeah, I mean that's what we're seeing. These these sort of wolfish like coyotes are in these these areas where there's they're really isolated and there's not a whole lot of hunting and and persecution or anything like that. Because once you get out of these properties, out of these swampy marsh complexes, and you get into the more ag areas and where you got cattle, I mean you have ongoing trapping and shooting and hunting and whatnot. Like and and when you have that kind of high turnover of um, animals, meaning that they're a lot of the animals are being shot and killed right away. The new ones move in. The, the red wolf ancestry just washes out because there's no wolves. So anything that's got that's wolf like gets shot and killed or trapped. Um, what's it, it's being replaced by coyotes. So you need to find these sort of isolated areas. Um, and, and the animals there just live longer and they breed and their offspring survive. And so it's retaining that ancestry because there's less turnover with the population. And so if we get a second, yeah. we get a second go down there, there's some spots I just could not get into because we ran out of radio collars. Um, so if we, if we get more collars up, I go back out there, like Johnson Bayou is really isolated. Some of those areas we might have to use a boat to get into yeah. um, and, and start trapping some spots out there and see what we can find. But um, yeah, the, the project is called like rediscovery of red wolf ancestry or something like that. I, I always forget our title. Well, the new, yeah, title. the new but, one is. But it, it's, it's not, it's, it's, what's interesting is like, it should be like the rediscovery of rediscovering. <laughs> How many times these animals exactly. were discovered? Like they thought they were gone in Texas until they found, <laughs> so some dude had like six skulls. He's like, these things are kind of big. And they're like, there was a wolf skulls. And they went out and surveyed East Texas. They're like, hey, yeah. there's wolves here. And they went and got some wolves for, our, for the program there. I mean, yeah, yeah it's just like, yeah, it should be like rediscovery squared or something like that. <laughs> the third time we're doing this. Yeah, it's crazy. Totally. I think it'll be interesting for you guys also just to put this out there that to, to also just study coyotes or whatever, coyote animal like animals um, yeah. when, when they're not persecuted. Like we don't know. You know what I'm saying? They're, they're so persecuted so much around all over the United States that it'll be interesting what you got, how different these animals in these more isolated areas where there, there's not that persecution. Oh, you should, you should right? have that. Yeah. You should have showed some of those, those trail cam photos you got on I got them, yeah. property where you get, you have the tall skinny one and the short fat oh, one. Oh yeah. It's all yeah. kinds of weird looking stuff. I've yeah. got a lot of great stuff from there and, and I do want to do a whole, a whole thing on that because we, it's just, you know, we're getting more and more interesting info. And now we've got the land manager and the, he runs the foundation who's really on board with us and he wants to start to share the story. So um, we had a good conversation yesterday about it. So I'm happy to, to, you know, move forward with that soon. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, um, yeah, the coyote, man, it, it's got such a broad geographic range throughout mm-hmm. North America. You see a lot of geographic variation that it should be a model species now to test a lot of like eco geographical, like, theory and stuff like that in terms of like like what we're doing with the the melanism like the glogger's rule or if you look at like bergman's rule whatever that's called like the idea that animals are supposed to get bigger as they go north you know in latitude or whatever but we don't see that with coyotes they violate that and in fact they do the opposite because they hybridize with red and eastern wolves they get they get big on an east west gradient not a north south gradient you know what i mean and so they're just yeah coyotes should be a, a model animal now for for wildlife research the same way like a yeah like a white lab rat is for like (laughs) medical stuff. (laughs) Well, I think this is going to have to be the next chapter um, for our next webinar with both of you. Oh yeah. And uh, because it looks like there's still a lot of untapped information to discover. Um, But that is the last of the questions, but um, except a lot of people want to know more about this podcast, where to find it. Um, it I'll let you do it, Amy. I, I, it's just, I mean, I think if you, if you just search, well, actually, if you go to um, my web, if you go to that website that we have linked right there that says redwolfproject.com, I have, I made a page for it that um, I'm going to start uploading all of them, but there's a link to it as well because it's available everywhere. It's on seven or eight platforms right now, but if that'll take you directly to it. Um, but if you search, like if you're on like Apple podcast, you, you should be able to search the Canid project and it should come up. It's new, so it may not, but um, otherwise you can find it under the podcast uh, tab on that website on the red wolf project website also if you follow us on instagram and twitter anytime like i've 
recently, the last week, I have a few um, links to it there as well. And that's where I will always be updating when we do have new episodes out. But yes, yeah, subscribe, please, because we're trying to, we really want to get a good audience um, going. And, uh, and we're going to be putting out pretty, pretty, uh, we'll put them out pretty often. So I'm excited about it. We got a lot of good ideas. And Perfect. Good, yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Um, well, thanks again to both of you. And also, um, thanks to everyone who joined us tonight. Uh, seriously, there's so many positive comments, um, Amy. So um, oh, thank you for is, having me. Yeah, this is a this is a different type of webinar. Um, and uh, and I know that I've I've just been glued to my screen. So uh, <laughs> I think a lot of people have been too. So uh, for everyone else, if you want to know uh, more about the Wolf Conservation Center or our scientific webinar series, um, or you can even go onto the page and find. Um, more info on Amy. Uh, if you have our website on your, you know, bookmarked or something, uh, we have her up there too. And of course, our 36 wolves who call the Wolf Center home. You can visit our website, and it's uh, nywolf.org. And uh, until then, um, I hope you all have a good evening. Bye, guys.